Good morning, everyone. I show that it's 1030. So welcome back um, to the forum. And um, I do want to recognize and I do want to um, extend my extreme apology to Dr. Kenny Yarbrough. Um, and I'm going to allow him to introduce himself this morning because I missed him during our team option. So Dr. Yarbrough, I'm going to hand it over to you for just a moment. All right, well, thank you. Good morning uh, to everyone. My name is Kenny Yarbrough and I serve as the Associate Vice Chancellor of Equity, Diversity, Inclusion and Support Programs. And I am joined today with a fabulous panel of individuals who, as we continue to go forward today, we will be discussing issues as it relates to uh, employing people with disabilities. And so we have a array of expertise on this panel today that I am so excited to be able to bring to you. Uh, I'm going to ask the first question to our first panelist, and I will introduce him. His name is Dr. James Collins. He serves in the, as an associate professor of special education in our College of Education and Professional Studies, as well as the director of the UWW Life Program. Good morning, Dr. Collins. And my first <laughs> question to you is, what is considered a disability? Well, a disability, it, it depends on who you ask and really whether it's applying to kind of general um, federal guidelines or what we might see, you know, for among the, the population or among students in schools. But generally speaking, a disability is classified as a person who has a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. And that's very broad. And the intention of that is to capture uh, a lot of people who may need um, to be supported, whether it be in an employment setting, whether it be in a college setting, or in a in a public education K through 12 type of an environment. Um, so what I just described is what we would consider generally what would be a disability in the employment sector. But in terms of public education, there are, well, there's actually 13, but arguably 14 different federal categories of disabilities that states then take, and they can collapse those categories and, and create their own. But that's what, um, in, in public education, how uh, teams of individuals help identify and provide supports for people who have disabilities in schools. But in terms of prevalence, I think the numbers are probably pretty surprising the most that a little bit more than one in four people has a disability in the United States. In fact, 26% of people uh, have some form of disability. When thinking of kind of how those shake out and how they're actually broken down, that about 14% of people have a disability with something involving mobility, something that just might make uh, stairs a little bit difficult or somebody who might need a, a wheelchair ramp or something just to really get access to a business. And once they get access, you know, essentially the, the playing field is leveled. It's just a matter of getting them in and providing access, making sure that they can navigate and get to the places where they need to go. Um, another about 11% of individuals have difficulty with some type of cognition, maybe thinking, maybe their working memory, maybe being able to recall multi-step pieces of info. I mean, there's a lot of different, uh, a lot of different areas. I mean, you might look at about 7% of persons having struggles with, say, independent living, maybe some, if you're familiar with adaptive behavior, things that might make it a little bit more difficult for someone to live without a roommate, to know, you know what to do in case of an emergency, who to call if you're not feeling well, things like that. Uh, and then another, about 6% of individuals have disabilities, say, related to hearing, that they might be able to hear, but they might just not be able to hear certain frequencies, or they might just uh, need some type of amplification to be able to hear you or, or customers at a business, for that matter. And then another, about 5% of individuals have visual impairments, and then about another 4% of folks have something related to self-care, whether it's hygiene, just being able to take care of yourself. But then if you contrast that, and that amounts to about 61 million people having a disability in the United States, then if you were to contrast that with statistics provided by the Department of, of Education, that there's about 7.1 million, the last, at least the last data that, that I, I was able to locate, about 7.1 million people with a disability or about 14% of all public school students in the pipeline. And they're, they're coming towards businesses soon. And it's just a matter of, preparing them, identifying them, and finding uh, gainful employment and finding locations where not only they can be successful, but they can help their employers be successful too. So James, just as a follow-up question, with thank you for the data that you've given us today. 
Do you think that there has been an increase in the number of persons with disabilities, say, uh, in 2020 contrasted with, say, 1990? I think that there, there has been, I mean, in some categories of disability, particularly if you look at, say, autism, for instance, or ASD, that it's had a, a, a large increase. But whether or not, I think arguably that could be the prevalence numbers could be an in increase of awareness. So I think that we're becoming more aware. A disability policy has continued to be strengthened ever since back in the 1970s. Anybody who's familiar with, say, Public Law 94-142, whenever we actually had a blueprint to begin serving uh, students with disabilities in schools. But then, of course, the ADA has, has continued um, improving upon that over the years. And I, so I do think that we have seen an increase in the numbers, but whether or not it's just because we're opening our eyes and ears a little bit more, that could be, uh, I, I think, certainly a plausible explanation too. But there's, uh, there's plenty out there. And I think that whenever, as we continue the dialogue and begin talking about the advantages of hiring persons with disabilities. I mean, it's just, it truly is an untapped workforce that, um, that has a whole lot of potential to offer to a whole lot of different employers. Thank you for that. So we'll move on. And as we are having our conversation this morning, uh, participants, if you have questions that you would like to ask the panelists, please feel free to drop those in the chat and I will read those as they come in. But you are more than welcome to ask questions of our uh, panelists with their extensive expertise. Next, I want to introduce Dr. Elizabeth Watson, who serves as our interim vice chancellor, excuse me, assistant vice chancellor for student affairs. Dr. Watson, what is the pipeline or access to employing individuals with disabilities? So this is a, a really critical question in today's economy. When we talk about return on investment, when we talk about how businesses can grow consumer bases, when we talk about finding new customers, when we talk about employing individuals, it's really important. Um, in 2019, the Department of Labor noted that only 19.3% of individuals who identify with a disability were employed, compared to 66.3% of the generalized population without a disability, and that's during the recession and when things were curving up and people were highly employed. So individuals with disabilities were still the most unemployed group of individuals in the United States and or underemployed. So there might be a significant number of individuals with disabilities who are working part-time or volunteering and not actively engaged in wage earning. And so those are really critical issues when we look at it, which tells you 80% of individuals with disabilities are looking for a job. And there's kind of this falsehood out there that people with disabilities don't want to work or that there's a lot of barriers to employment for individuals with disabilities. And one of the things that this team will tell you is there's, real no, there's really no barrier to employment for individuals with disabilities. Um, Dr. Crowley and I later um, will be talking about accommodations in the workforce and how that can mitigate that. But the pipeline is huge it's underutilized. And there's a number of unintentional barriers that come into play. There's a lot of stereotypes and false assumptions that we really need to bust down to go back to what Dr. Collins was talking about. For example, um, the growth and identification of individuals with disabilities. If we look at destigmatizing mental health, that is a population over the last five years of individuals who would be classified under any federal state definition. And it's important to know for us in the state of Wisconsin, the definition, the state of Wisconsin law for individuals with disabilities is actually a broader, more encompassing. And individuals with mental health have been um, typically not identified as individuals with disabilities if we go back 10, 15, 20 years, unless it was very chronic and severe. And as we look at destigmatization, we look at individuals with mental health being more comfortable identifying and engaging. So the pipelines out there are rich. There are individuals. Um, I have to say great thanks to the great work of James Collins's and departments and special education. We're seeing an increase in the number of students with disabilities graduating from the K-12 system. Um, and entering from primary to secondary and now a higher transition to college post-secondary in the state of Wisconsin when you look at the transition data from the state of Wisconsin public instruction to post-secondary the largest increase is in our technical college system which is an amazing pipeline development system so there are opportunities to recruit hire and retain individuals with disabilities through partnerships with the k-12 program through the technical colleges, 
through the post-secondary institutions and with our colleagues and partners in the Department of Workforce Development through the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation, which is a state agency that's solely focused on helping individuals with disabilities become employed and working with employers to connect with individuals. So when we look within our state, we have a number of amazing resources. When we look nationally, those same resources are expanded. What we do see and what we do know um, and there is an amazing study through an agency called Disability In that shows corporations that diversify their workforce to include persons with disabilities increase their bottom line. They make more money. So the argument that individuals with disabilities might cost us money as employees or in that retention and gaining process is completely null and void. That is one of the stereotypes today that if the end of this three days we learn anything, that doesn't hold true. Diversification of workforce improves bottom dollar. Dr. Yarbrough? Thank you so much. And just as a follow-up, you know, I was thinking about um, what you said in terms of persons with disabilities are underutilized workforce and the removal of the stigma that people have with, uh, uh, towards persons with disabilities. And I think that's why this uh, particular conference, again, utilizing the word uh, you will, working uh, for inclusion, leadership, and learning, we've got to embed that in every facet of our organizations. And so to remember that this, this workforce, if we can strip ourselves of our biases, me and Dr. Crawley do a lot of training around unconscious bias. And, you know, when we stop thinking that these persons are not um, able to participate in the workforce, you know, we are, we're doing our, our, our in the institutions, our organizations and corporations a disadvantage. So thank you so much for that. Next, I want to move to our, our mistress of ceremony and our host today, Dr. Janelle Crawley, who serves as our chief human resources officer here at UW-Whitewater. And Dr. Crawley, my question for you is, what are the best practices to include persons with disabilities in the workplace? And Dr. Crawley. Thank you, Dr. Yarbrough. Thank you, Dr. Yarbrough. Um, you know, one of the um, really simplest measures that we so often forget is simply speaking A to the candidate or speaking to the employee. Number one, it's really important that you allow people to know that you are an inclusive work employer, an equal, em equal opportunity employer, and you welcome everyone to apply. Um, I think it starts there. It starts in how we are, uh, what our reputation is and how we are inviting those individuals to be inclusive. But it's interesting because so often um, something is so overlooked something so simple. And I just have to highlight, I was brought into a community um, several years ago because they were panicked because they had a candidate who was in a wheelchair. And they were concerned because they didn't know what to do because how is this person going to get a drink of water? So they were, they were explaining and showing me all of these wonderful plans and how they were adapting their buildings, their historical buildings, their facilities, um, to the different buildings throughout the community. And, and I said, well, have you spoken to the employee that you are interested in hiring? And it was really a deer in the headlights look. And I said, um, I think if you were to speak to the employee, I think the individual would probably come up with the same solution that I would have for you. And that's maybe to put a little holder with Dixie cups right alongside the water fountain. <coughs> Sorry, that's my dog. Um, but that was, a, you know, basically a $5 fix. And they were looking at $1.2 million for all of their buildings. So, so it really is so simple is to create a very inclusive work environment and not to be afraid to speak to the individual to find out what their needs are. Sometimes it's really, really simple. Thank you for that. And I'm going to open this next question up, uh, but then I would like to invite one of one of, or two of our panelists to follow up after I finish. And the question is, why should organizations care about hiring persons with disabilities? And I think, you know, all of us in our own way have already touched on that. But I would contribute to that, that inclusivity matters. 
you know, just as much as we like to see representation of different genders and different ethnicities and different races, persons with disabilities want to see themselves represented in the workforce force and see someone that they can pattern themselves after. So inclusivity matters, representation matters. Uh, to Dr. Crawley's point in terms of when organizations are trying to figure out what they need to do to help attract and retain uh, persons with disabilities, ask the people with disabilities what they need. <laughs> You know, sometimes I think we, we make things a little more complicated than what they have to be. And I think if we include that voice of representation, then people will be able to voice their own opinion and give their um, vantage point when it comes to these types of discussions. Um, lastly, well not lastly, I have one more point before I end, uh, two more points before I end. It's part of the brand identity. Most organizations, they tout the fact that they are a welcoming, inclusive, um, type of environment. And so when we don't see persons with disabilities included, then that is a um, distortion of their brand identity. And lastly, it improves morale, it improves diversity, it improves um, the culture of that organization. So those are just some of the things that I thought of. Uh, any other panelists would like to uh, chime in on why should organizations care about hiring persons with disabilities? Sure. I would like to start with that um, because I did do um, I, I did do an article several years ago. Um, one of the most noteworthy reasons to hire someone with disabilities is their productivity level is through the roof. Um, also, um, their um, percentage of sick time is extremely low. Their um, the um, workers' compensation, again, extremely low. So the fears that some employers have are, are simply not true. And Dr. Watson mentioned that it is uh, when you create that more inclusive, your return on investment goes up. Well, I will tell you that also when you look at the tenure and the length of time that an employee works for an organization with a disability is um, usually much greater. It's often more than double of what another employee would be. Sometimes it's, you know, it's a, it's a, a legacy um, relationship with the employer. So all of the concerns and doubts um, are refuted statistically. So that's a huge reason to uh, really reach out and try to uh, recruit those with disabilities. Thank you, James. You were going to contribute? Sure. You know, I was just thinking that, that I've been asked before, what are the advantages of, of hiring somebody who has dis, a, a disability or disabilities? And I think the, the, the first question that's always come to my mind is, well, what are the disadvantages? And I think that there, there are so many stereotypes and just incorrect assumptions about what somebody is capable of doing. And you know, what I always like to reflect on is, is just how able uh, folks with disabilities can be and, and are. And it's just a matter of find, aligning one's capabilities with the demands at the job. And I mean, just like anybody, I mean, for me, it's, it's finding a job that aligns with my skill set, with my interests, and it's, it's no different for anybody else. So I think that what are the disadvantages? And, and I struggle to find those as long as an employer is really making a workplace accessible and trying to tap into this uh, very, rather large pool of quite capable individuals. And I, I think that if, if as one learns more about disability, they can begin to, to discover that not only does, uh, I mean, a disability not define somebody, and I hope that everybody's noticed the language that panelists are using today, that it's the person with a disability. We, we put the person first, and little subtleties like that may not mean a whole lot to other people, but it, it means a lot to us. And I think that just like anybody else, I mean, if you wear glasses or maybe if you can't hear so well, I, I don't think that it would be fair, and I, I doubt that you'd agree that that defines you. And that's very much from the, the perspective where we're viewing these things from. And, you know, I, another important feature is just the massive pool that I mentioned. There's so many people. I mean, there's millions of people out there who are qualified and who could be just outstanding employees. It's just a matter of recruiting them and making sure that others in the workplace are, of course, available and, and at least aware of somebody else's needs and maybe what you should say, what you shouldn't say, how can you support your colleagues? Just like anybody else who might have something going on in their life 
anybody who has something that might affect their day to day work. It's just a matter a, a basic matter of understanding their needs and how we can best support them. And I, you know, my colleagues, I don't care what their backgrounds are, what their disability status is. What I care about is them and how can I support them? And it's just a matter of learning how we can do that effectively as employers. And I, I think that the other thing and this, and I know Dr. Yarbrough mentioned this too, but it, it popped in my head, just the importance of bringing a diverse crew together on your team. Because I mean, I, I can't imagine. And, and when I talk to my students in class about the structure of say, uh, we, we have meetings in public education where we determine the eligibility of students, where we determine the outcomes. I mean, what we do in terms of instructional outcomes, you know, we, we, we try to set the stage for growth and instruction in areas that students truly need. But you don't just want me to be on that team. I mean, I, I have my own line of thought. I have my own perceptions, my own experiences. But what really helps shape the way that I see things and the way that I work with others is when I hear their lived experiences and I hear what they consider whenever something is important. And, you know, from a business perspective, I think that, I mean, aren't your customers important too? I mean, I think that's also an important feature and having people who represent your customers and who can say, you know, I think that that would be really cumbersome for somebody who has a disability to maybe a mobility, maybe a physical disability to use, but how could we maybe improve it by doing X, Y, and Z? I mean, those types of things can improve the bottom line. They can make things more accessible. And ultimately we're all on the same team here that they can benefit the bottom line by bringing in those diverse thinkers, people who have different experiences. And it's no different than if you have a, a medical type of a need that I'd be willing to bet that if you're getting some degree of high, high level of support, you're going to have a multidisciplinary team there to support you. And employers, uh, I, I don't view it as being too different, to be honest. I mean, I think that we need multidisciplinary teams to represent everybody, to make sure that the workflow is reasonable and to make sure that we're tuned in and in step with our customers and, and our constituents, whoever those may be. And I think that, um, yeah, it's uh, it, everybody can win in a scenario like that. And it's only a matter of debunking stereotypes, knocking down some barriers. And, you know, with that, I'll share what we've done at, at UW Whitewater that most recently, the uh, starting, well, it was last year that our program opened, but the UWW Life program, which is its life is an acronym, is learning is for everyone, that, you know, 20 years ago, you might not have thought that students who have significant disabilities, significant intellectual disabilities, such as somebody who has Down syndrome, or somebody who might be academically well below their peers, could go to college. And in fact, we have students living on campus now who are attending classes, who are being quite successful and doing amazing work. And they're contributing a lot. In fact, Dr. Yarbrough had some of our students, hosted some of our students recently to talk about their experiences on campus, to talk about disability. And you know, if you think that that's possible, if, if you reflect on your years in college and, and you think of you know this uh, somewhat narrow mindset of only people who are worthy or eligible who, who happen to fit this mode, that's that's wrong. And we're, we're doing things very different. And this pipeline that we're creating, not just from the UWW Life Program, but from the Center of Students with Disabilities that, that Dr. Watson has had leadership of for a very long time and has crafted this into just this incredible program that supports students with disabilities in my traditional courses that I teach. And I've seen the impact that we can have. And I've experienced that. And I think that it's, it's only a matter of others seeing and experiencing that too, before we can really begin changing the direction and improving some rather horrible outcomes. If you look at statistics for students with disabilities, particularly, or young adults with disabilities, particularly those with more significant disabilities, I mean, in the unemployment rate is well above 60%. I mean, it's horrible. And, it's, and that's even back, the numbers I'm citing, I'm thinking of the latest ones back from around 2018, back when unemployment for the masses was at 4%. So you think about, and that's particularly for students or young adults with intellectual disabilities who have much more significant needs, but are quite capable. And it's just a matter of structuring the environment and making sure that we're pulling in the supports needed. And you're tapping into a brand new workforce who can do incredible things. And as, as Dr. Crowley mentioned, I mean, there's lots of other advantages there too. I mean, in terms of loyalty, in terms of, I mean, your retention, I mean, there's there's, there's a whole lot of advantages and I, I truly struggle to find disadvantages when I think about what we can do as, I mean, not only society, but from an employer perspective where you've got to make money. 
I think we can help with that. And, and that's one of the reasons why we're here today. You know, uh, Dr. Collins, it's really fun to leapfrog off of the amazing things that um, Dr. Yarbrough, Dr. Um, Crowley, and you have said. And I want to I want to anchor back into one of the points that you said is one in four individuals in the United States, based on the last census and on data that we've collected, have a disability. And some of that's for really great reasons. Healthcare advances in the last 15 years have allowed so many individuals with chronic health or complicated health conditions whose lifespans have been expanded and whose quality of life has improved. So, you know, I can look back on my career in working with individuals with disabilities which spans about 32 years now. Um, so I'm 35, no. Um, but the fact is, is that uh, I became an interpreter for the deaf when I was a sophomore in college. Um, I had grown up with friends who were deaf and learned sign language. It was my second language. Um, I have a hidden disability. I have auditory processing disorder due to medical conditions that disrupted my hearing between the ages of three and four. So um, I worked with speech language pathology. My fifth grade principal was never so happy as to see me leave school and go on to middle school um, because of how I demonstrated maybe some of my not best behavior in the classroom um, with frustration over reading and fluency because I was very much a delayed reader. Um, and what I always tell people when they ask me about that is I said, I'm still Dr. Watson. Um, so I, I, I was a delayed reader. I was not a strong academic student. That didn't grow for me until high school, until I had more capability. So I had years of catching up to do um, and, and a family that supported it, but never had access to special education because I never quite fell into that range. And it wasn't actually until I was an adult um, that my auditory processing was identified. Why, why, my, why I hear process and use speech the way that I do sometimes. So there's these hidden disabilities that are out there. And I know there's just like this expansive world that we tend to assume ableism, mm -hmm. right? There's, there's a term called ableism. And we talk about it as a disability. And all that's implying is there's an aspect that, I, that it may not be my strength a functional limitation. And there's very much an ableistic society. And it is amazing to start seeing models with disabilities, right? It, young persons with um, intellectual disabilities, autism spectrum or Down syndrome, Target has had one of the best campaigns for inclusive modeling that they've had in a really long time to be more representative of families. And if you're a family, you want to shop at a place that advertises a family that looks like yours, right? So as we start looking at why we hire persons with disabilities, well, you want to hire persons with disabilities because you want to start having that face that says, this is who we are. This is a part of the world of work that we participate in. The other thing, though, is I want to go back to what Dr. Crowley said. All the research, all the research supports that individuals with disabilities are more loyal, less likely to change their job, miss less work, um, and have more continuity of employment. And if you're looking at a return on your investment, you want to retain your employees in the longest amount of time. It's very expensive to hire and onboard a new employee. And when you can engage and retain that person, you can be really successful. And you can save your company, your business, your small business, your community money and grow business through that. The other thing to remember is as we age, Becoming a person with a disability, having a disability is a category that has no discriminatory qualifications to allow you in. Socioeconomic, age, race, ethnicity, gender, gender orientation, educational level, geographical, country of origin, none of those matter because all of us are temporarily able-bodied neurotypical, temporary. Because as we age, we may not want to say we have a disability. You may just want to say, I'm aging. Oh, my knee hurts. My hip hurts. My shoulder hurts. We age into disability. And when we have a society that is equitable and inclusive, 
we are all a full participants in that society. So if we go back to what Dr. Collins goes back to, which is all the way to the very beginning of our educational systems, the more that we have seamless entry and transition and all the way through engagement to employment to aging, the better our society is because we are all a part of this identity group as we transition through life. You know, you, you've said so much and panelists, thank you so much for commenting on that question and to our participants. I do want to remind you that the chat box is open to you. And if you have any questions for the panel, please, and please make sure that you contribute those. But so many of you said so many um, little nuggets that I kept trying to write down little things so I wouldn't uh, forget it. Back to Elizabeth's point about we age into disability. If I don't write it down at this point in life, <laughs> it might go through one ear and out the other. But, you know, I, I think about how, uh, James, and I think you brought up this statistics, and if I'm correct in what I remember you saying, you said one in every four persons will have a disability. But as I look at our panel, <laughs> we're beyond that just in, in ourselves in terms of those that have uh, visible and invisible disabilities. And so I think going back to the point um, that Elizabeth, you brought up in terms of having to grow into how you needed to become managing uh, the disability that you didn't know what it was called to later in life. And, you know, I, I think about and reflect back on my own um, maturation as a, as a child. I had dyslexia and didn't know it until, you know, I was, and, and this is back in, way back in the day, <laughs> but, you know, we had the resource class and everybody with whatever type of disability was placed into that one class. And so I remember my mother having to be a very strong advocate to say, it's nothing wrong with him. He, le he learns differently and you have to learn to teach him differently. And I think about those persons who didn't have that type of um, advocacy. But then the other piece of that is when you solidify into your identity development and identity development is more than just race. It's more than just gender expression. It's more than just sexuality. It's, it's learning how to embrace all of you. And corporations now are, are understanding that. So now we have affinity groups for persons with different identities within their organization and how it builds that camaraderie, it builds that teamwork, it builds that understanding that we're all in this together, even though we have differences. So I wanna move on to another question and I wanna pitch this to both uh, James and Janelle, and then I'm gonna circle back with a follow-up question to you, Elizabeth. And this is, the question is, what are reasonable accommodations? And I want James to answer that first from his vantage point, and then I'm gonna to toss it to Janelle to answer from her vantage point as a Chief Human Resources Officer. Absolutely, no, these are, these are great, great questions, good dialogue. And I think that just, you know, I, I was just, it's just striking when you think about that, I guess the perceptions of people, just to loop back briefly to the statistics about disability, that even just this panel, and you look at where we've had two people on this panel self-disclose some disability and look where they are now and look what they're doing and look at the leadership that they're providing and look at how that has not limited their ability to move up and to do good things and it just reminds me as a, I'm, i've had a varied background i'm a school psychologist in addition to a special educator among other things and one of the things that caught my eye initially is as a brand new person out in the field who was testing students Back in the day, as Dr. Yarbrough was mentioning, that you know, if you have a reading difficulty, we do a lot of testing and, and try to identify and diagnose. But one of the things that I, I, I noticed as a very young school psychologist was that folks who I was testing who were referred for having a disability, they were often smarter than what I would expect from an average person in the population. They just had a narrow area that was it's specific, in fact. And when you look at disability statistics, the most common disability you can encounter, at least among students coming out of the K through 12 setting, is a student who has a learning dis a specific learning disability in a narrow area. It might be related to writing. It might be related to something related to receptive or expressive language. Or it might even be related to a central auditory processing disorder. And that leads me into accommodations. Because one of the things that I did, I was thinking, as Dr. Watson mentioned that, I was thinking of a student who I used to work with who struggled in the classroom until we did one simple thing. And that was provide her at the time, it was, it was called an FM system, which are kind of like little earbuds like I've got. And we would have the teacher wear a little clip that would make sure that all of the voice of the, of the teacher, the instructor, was booming directly into the student's ear to make sure that they were engaged. And there's different types of, of central auditory processing disorders, but this is one of the things that truly helped the student. It was an accommodation. 
And that one little thing was really what set the stage for success. It was just a matter of identifying what that was. So when you think about accommodations, whether they're school-based, whether they are in an employment type of a setting, they, they don't have to be cumbersome. And in fact, accommodations are primarily those that are easy to deploy, they're reasonable, and they make things work for everybody, not only the employer, but the employee. I mean, just one simple example of an accommodation could be adjusting somebody's schedule to allow them to take care of medical needs or to allow them to take care of personal needs, whatever that may be. You know, I've, I've worked with a student who had weak muscle tone in her, a young adult who, who had weak muscle tone in her legs, who all that she needed to be successful at her job at the grocery store was a stool to be able to sit down and take periodic breaks. But it didn't hinder her ability to do her job. It didn't put the employer out. It, accommodations are nothing to be scared of. And in fact, when you think about accommodations, you know, businesses in general collectively need to be accommodative to persons with disabilities. But that doesn't mean that every single square footage of the space has to be accommodated. You know, you don't have to break down walls. You don't have to, to raise a building. It's, it's usually pretty simple things that employers can do to provide access and success for people with disabilities. Even something as simple as setting up environmental prompts to help somebody know what to do to follow a sequence. And I don't know, I was, if you've ever been through a drive through and kind of peeked in the window, you can sometimes see where the burger, there's a sequence there that has environmental prompts to help show somebody what to do, to help provide reminders. What if you could do that in your back room when someone's stocking the shelves? What if you could do that in an area where somebody just needs a little bit of extra guidance, some prompting? We can do that. We can do that with technology. I can do that with things on, on phones. We can make tutorials to tell somebody how to do something in the event that I'm not there to help them or say they're somebody at their in a place of business isn't there to help them either. They, they could figure it out themselves. So I think there's that, there's other than just making the workplace generally accessible, what about using a service animal? I mean, that's, that's a very reasonable accommodation and it can, it's something that can be used both in public education and in the private sector in businesses. Um, even alternative forms for feedback. I mean, what if you have somebody who has central auditory processing disorder it, it, and, and they might be struggling to understand what you're presenting to them verbally? Well, couldn't we just provide them some written feedback or vice versa? What if somebody doesn't really read so hot, but they can hear you really well? Well, maybe we could provide some verbal feedback to take some time to speak with somebody and talk things to them. What if somebody has a working memory type of a difficulty where they struggle to keep a lot of things in their head at one time? What if we just give them steps one at a time and then check for understanding after we share those expectations we want them to do? So, you know, we can even provide a visual, a, a visual calendar for students students, for individuals, I'm so used to working with my students, for persons with disabilities, say on a whiteboard in the back room, there could be a checklist of you, here's what you do first, here's what you do second, here's third, fourth, and fifth. After that, it's break time. You take a break and you start your timer, and then you return when the timer is up. I mean, we can set folks up for success in so many different areas. And I think that, um, you know, even just providing frequent breaks for someone, I'm not saying give someone uh, less time on the clock. No, frequent breaks and just chopping up their schedule. Maybe it means that they're there for 10 hours for a 10 hour shift, but they're taking frequent breaks to make sure that they can take care of whatever they need to take care of. And these are the simple things that can be just extraordinarily important for employers. And it's just a matter of awareness. And that's part of the things, and we're going to expand on some of these topics, even with our sessions that will continue throughout the, uh, the remainder of this panel, or throughout this week, rather, for the, uh, the conference. But, uh, but yeah, those are just some, and I imagine Dr. Crowley has some additional uh, points to chime in with that, too. Thank you, Dr. Collins. And, and it just makes me smile because, you know, some of these things that we talk about that we're willing to do for our employees also pertains to some of our family members as well. So um, this, is, um, this is a lifelong opportunity for everyone. And I think of so many corporations you may have heard of, um, World's Finest Chocolates. I think almost every young student has sold chocolate. I mean, that's a company that they have wonderful environmental signs all around their, um, their warehouse. Phenomenal, they have done phenomenal work in supporting and engaging an inclusive work environment. Weber's, you know, the Weber Grills, um, Jewel Food Company. But I have also had the opportunity to work with the transition program. But I would say as an employer, um, the average accommodation 
is probably less than $50 if you really look at it. I mean, how much does it cost for a, a regular screen? You know, a regular computer screen is what, 18 inches, 20 inches? And for what, 30 more dollars, you can get a big screen that really helps the visually impaired. I mean, what a nice opportunity for someone or someone that's just a little piece of uh, plastic that you can put on it on something that you're reading to make it enhance the, the words for people. So there are so many simple processes that um, any occupational health provider will also help and durable medical equipment. They have lots of resources. There are so many resources to help an organization identify a very simple way of addressing an accommodation and creating a very inclusive environment. I've worked with um, law enforcement agencies um, to help someone who is um, on the autism spectrum, but that person I helped get hired in 2009 still works there today and handles all of their evidence, something that is a perfectionist requirement. So it really is an opportunity to think out of the box and put the right people together, and that I think is what we're trying to do here. Um, the Opera House, they needed someone who really could um, enhance all of their brass and polish their brass. There's so many opportunities. Um, a young lady worked at Jewel. She started there when she was 16 in the high school program, and she just recently turned 45. She's still working at Jewel something simple, and she just needed auditory signs around Jewel so she could do her job. She's still there. She's high up on the tenure list. She has a better retirement than her parents. So um, the important thing here to take away as an employer is to, to think out of the box and keep it simple. Ask the employee because they will help you identify it. Um, I worked with one organization and they had six steers to get down into this big training room. Um, unfortunately, they used um, different individuals from different areas of their community to help carry the person down to that room. And I said, you know, there's a real simple chair that will allow the person to go down. <laughs> it was a real simple process. So it doesn't have to be difficult. We can, and we are, we are resources. So if anyone has any questions, we can certainly connect people on where to go for some of these resources. Thank you so much. And as we continue to have this conversation around uh, accommodations and accessibility, Elizabeth, you've done a lot of research and you've done a lot of work working with people, uh, specifically companies around technology and mm -hmm. accessibility. So my question to you da, is, what does accessibility and technology mean to our changing world? And how does that impact people with disabilities, one? And then how does it impact the organizations that they can work for? So Elizabeth, please. So I've, I've had the privilege of meeting the chief accessibility officers of Apple, Microsoft, Google, and Facebook. You can't come up with a more dynamic team that understand and know that if there isn't accessibility to those products and those platforms, they won't retain their customer base. Right. So I put in the chat and I hope everybody goes and views it. Um, in 2019, Microsoft did a commercial focusing on the first adaptive um, controller for the Xbox. And it's um, it, for those of us who are gamers in the world, an Xbox controller is kind of small. It requires a lot of fine motor coordination um, and triggering. So it involves a minimum of um, three digits plus a thumb. You have to have that opposable thumb to make those switches work. In addition to that, it has kind of a weight balance to it and a sensitivity of vibration feedback depending on what scale of Xbox controller. Now, this is not PlayStation. We can talk about Nintendo as well. All of our companies are looking at exploring this. But what Xbox did is they developed a controller because they did a focus group and one young woman wrote a seven-year-old wrote a letter to Xbox, to Microsoft, and said, why can't I game? Why can't I play your games? And a engineer developer took that to heart, called her up, started saying, what's the problem? Why can't you game? Why can't you do these things? And developed a relationship with this young woman, and in the process, went to the Microsoft incubator 
think tank Microsoft funds incubation projects and allows people to shift over and buy out to develop new products. And he went off and developed the accessible micro box, um, micro, Microsoft Xbox controller, which allows for a plug-in. It's a square, it's bigger, it looks a little bit like a switch if you have one, but it's bigger with more of the controls, and it has 42 adaptions that you can add to it. So you can add a button, you can add a switch, you can have an elbow switch, a head switch, you can do anything. So if you take a moment during the next break, I really encourage you to log into that because then the Microsoft team was going to create this really slick commercial about their accessibility. And what they ended up doing is interviewing kiddos, young kiddos between the ages of kind of seven and 14 about what gaming meant to them. And they ended up not doing the commercial they thought they were gonna do. Instead, they let the youth be the voice of why this matters. So you can't, you can't engage in that. When you look at gaming, gaming is an environment um, where you can express yourself, right? That's a whole technology environment where you can go into. And if you're a person who uses a wheelchair and rocks and rolls, your wheelchair is not a restriction in a virtual world. But I also wanna go back and step back into some really simple technology. When I was a young counselor back in Texas, um, I was approached by um, air traffic controller for an individual who was a, uh, incomplete tetraplegic or quadriplegic, which means this injury was around the C3-4 level, and this person really only had the capability to use their head and sip and puff, no hand control, so neck up behavior, neck up control. And I got to work with three engineers out of IBM to develop a system that allowed this individual to turn on their computer and do data entry. That project cost about $127,000. Um, and for those of you who remember back in the day, we were really excited if a computer had any memory in it, then they used these big, big floppy disks. That's a floppy disk. We'll, talk, we'll do a history lesson on technology later. So the device I'm holding up in front of you right now, your cell phone, um, just for funds with just our panel. And actually, if you look down on your screen, there's something called a reaction, and this will help me feel like people are paying attention. How many of you have talked to your phone, dictated something, texted? I, I know I have, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna give us a, a thumbs up on that in the reaction. Anybody else? I would really love to see some reactions pulling up here. If you talk to your phone, thank a person with a disability. Ray Kurzweil originally entered, um, created text-to-speech and speech-to-text automation. And for the purpose of it was to allow individuals predominantly as an educational tool. Apple bought the platform from Kurzweil, and that is now Siri. So everything that you do with that, Google then has since also developed their own voice automated platform, which all of the technology goes back to Ray Kurzweil's original technology. And the um, artificial intelligence now that builds upon our voices to anticipate and, and project for us. So what our phones can do for us and what we need to do with Apple, Microsoft, Google, and Facebook, these leaders, Amazon now, in terms of technology is amazing. Once upon a time, you had to buy four or five different kinds of software products to adapt your laptop to do anything. If you use an Apple, there's ease of accessibility. If you use Mac or um, if you use a um, Microsoft platform, you can go in and do accessibility options. And if you do open platform and networking, you can build those softwares into it through free networking if you're doing something um, on an Oracle or open area. So the technology that's out there is amazing. And 97% of the time it's amazing and 3% of the time it's the barrier. So as technology has advanced, that's where legislation celebrating the 30th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act is so critical. Back in July, 1990, that legislation was signed into effect, and part of that was the Telecommunications Act, and since then has moved into the Americans with Disabilities um, uh, the Amendments Act and Section 508 of the Federal Rehabilitation Act, which now say that technology has to be accessible. And the leaps and bounds made in this technology are the things now that capture Ring 
so much of the technology that was implemented, how many of us have ever texted? Remember back in the day when you had a little flip phone and you had to be able to text on it, you had to remember, you know, A, B, C, and you had to scan through that, one, two, three. So when pager devices were first implemented for individuals who were deaf, Federal um, Commission on Communications required that cell phones have an equivalent communication. And back in the day, that was the relay system or a TTY. And when we started going into cell phones, cell phones didn't have the same capability to communicate with individuals who are deaf because it was over radio frequencies and wave frequencies. And so texting was the mandate for accessibility for individuals who are deaf. And it is the only way my children talk to me now. <laughs> so what we need to, I mean, like the, I, I remind them this thing actually can call me. Yes. Adam, call me. Okay. But the fact is, is that a lot of the technology that we take for granted today, and you can hear how passionate and enthusiastic I am about this, is thank a person with a disability. The reason you can text is because somebody was deaf. The reason you can talk to your phone is because somebody who needed to be able to get speech to text with limited physical mobility or a learning disability needed to get their words to paper. So these barriers that pioneers created solutions for are now part of our everyday life. Let's go back, and here's the last example I'll give, because I could. this is a whole world that I live in. Let's go back. Has anybody ever seen the commercial for the clapper? Clap on, lights on. There was never anybody under the age of 74 in that commercial, right? Because the assumption is the reason I needed a clapper is I was too frail to get up and turn off and on my lights. So I wanted to have that safety. By the time I got in bed, if I had to get up and turn my lights off, I might fall. And then I would need the device that says, help, I've fallen, come and get me. If you have an Amazon Alexa or a Google in your house, all of those now have adapters that you can plug into that turn off and on your lights. All of those have devices that allow you to observe or interact with your rooms and your spaces. All of that structure was built off the fact that somebody wanted to turn a light off and not have to get out of bed when we track that back. Um, now, granted, the marketers love to hear everything we're talking about as well because you'll get that commercial as soon as you say something. But there is so much technology now that used to be high cost that is now embedded into our everyday lives that is making things better for individuals with disabilities. And again, those barriers to employment, this perception that this will be expensive, overwhelming, many of these things, um, my sign language is good. I'm not interpreter level anymore. It's not even great. I, it's just like my Spanish. I know I can order a beverage, um, but I may not be able to tell you how much I want for something. But the fact is, is that there's text to speech, speech to text, and you can text and type each other and have real time conversations. And when we expand this into secondary blended identity development, it can do this for 47 foreign languages for me as well. Thank you for that. So we are winding down our time. We have a couple of more questions and then we will uh, wrap up our panel discussion today. So I'm going to ask a question and I'm going to answer the first part and then I want to ask uh, Janelle to jump in for the second part. And then the last question we will leave for Elizabeth. So the question that's before us now is, how do we create a safe space to ask questions and support persons with disabilities? And so I will say these few things. One, don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, I think most people will appreciate you asking rather than assuming. Um, allow people to be human. They will make a mistake. They will say some things out of turn, but there is that educational piece that we've got to work with people to get them up to where they need to be. And this is all in learning how to create that safe environment. Um, no, acknowledge and know that mistakes will happen and give people grace to grow from where they are to where they need to go to. And then for those persons who are not people with disabilities, make sure that you're allies and advocates for those who are. We use the term ally and advocate for, for a lot of uh, other identities, but I think um, this particular identity as well deserves to have allies and advocates. And lastly, be present. Uh, there are so many times when we're trying to create a, a safe space, we try to detach ourselves from it. But I think we need to make sure that we're present in the moment as we're trying to create that safe space. 
Uh, Janelle, would you have anything to contribute to that as well? Yes, thank you, Dr. Yarbrough. And um, I always I always learn so much when I'm part of this discussion. Um, I think one of the things that I have observed um, in my um, human resources profession as a practitioner and um, a unique background that I bring to the table is that um, oftentimes a supervisor, maybe even a colleague, will say something to the individual that um, um, maybe would be better said in a different room or in the hallway instead of in a room with other people or maybe not right standing by their workplace kiosk where three or four other people might be around um, if they have a question. Um, I think anyone with a disability um, is, is certainly willing to reach out and ask for help. I mean, um, Dr. Watson was there the other day um, when there was no sound and, and I needed some help understanding what was being said and she was able to interpret for me and at least get me through that hump until I was able to get the sound back on. Um, so it really is just a matter of being engaging, being in the moment, realize that um, if you start to have a conversation and you think it's going down the wrong path, you know, if you get that feeling in the chest or if it's not feeling right in the in the brain, you know, maybe stop, stop the conversation and say, you know, can we talk in the hallway? I just have a question just for you. And they'll be happy to share what their needs are. Thank you so much for that. And our last question uh, today, and it's going to uh, Elizabeth Watson, Dr. Elizabeth Watson. What are the benefits for the assessment tool that the UWIL team has developed and how can it be useful to employers? So we're really excited to bring um, a free tool to businesses, companies, communities, educational provider environments. Trying to figure out if you're accessible can be, can be kind of complicated and tricky and feel overwhelming and if we go back into the days when I did accessibility audits back for Motorola and IBM back in 93 and 94, we had binders and binders and binders to go through and they were painful. So the new tool is something that's online. You can click, you can fill it out. Um, there'll be, there's a link provided to it. We'll be um, actually talking about it tomorrow, um, but it is off, it should be off the, the website link that people can log into right now. And what it does is it allows you to have a way as a company, a business, a community or educational provider to evaluate where you are and establish some benchmarks on where you wanna move. And as good as anybody is, there's always an opportunity to get better. There's always a way to use that information to improve your marketing, to expand your client base, and or to expand your employee base, or to update policies, procedures, and practices. So our goal is not to create something that's like, aha, you're not doing good. The goal is to find out where you are, help you establish those benchmarks, and prioritize and move forward. So there are so many good things coming forward that we can take a look at, and we're excited to be able to have the ABC Accessibility Beyond Compliance tool available and live today. Thank you so much. Panelists, I appreciate your expertise and your candor with sharing with our virtual audience on today. Audience, we appreciate the time that you have taken to listen to these um, subject matter experts in their fields. We ask that you meet us back at one o'clock for our keynote. Thank you so much and have a great rest of the afternoon. Take care.